everybody kind of gets situated. People will still be coming in from the gym. We're just gonna play a quick game. Um, so it's just a simple true or false. If I'm gonna say a statement and if it's true, you can stand up, and if you think it's false, say seating, seated. And then if you get four right, you can just walk right up, grab a piece of candy, and take it back to your seat. All right, so we're gonna roll through pretty quick, so you have to listen. So the first one is, it takes a sloth two weeks to digest a meal. So if you think it's true, you stand. If you think it's false, you stay seated. <laughs> <laughs> you, if you're standing, you are correct. <laughs> this is the slowest digestion time of any mammal. All right, the next one is China has the longest coastline in the world. You guys are smart. <laughs> um, it is false, so it is Canada that has the longest coastline. All right, the average human sneeze can be clocked at 100 miles per hour. True stand, seat, false seating. All right, if you are standing, you are correct. <laughs> okay, the next one is Hawaiian pizza comes from Canada. Yes. <laughs> I did not know that until we, I moved here. <laughs> but yes, you are correct. <laughs> All right. The next one is pineapples grow on trees. If you think pineapples grow on trees, you are wrong. It is false. They grow in the ground. <laughs> Okay, this one I expect you guys to know. There are 30 NHL teams. If that is true, stand. If it is false, stay seated. It is false. There are 32 NHL teams. <laughs> okay, the next one is the letter E is the most common letter in the English language. If that is true, you stand. You are correct, it is true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and fortune cookies were invented in China. <laughs> it is a false. They were created in the United States. <laughs> All right, the next one is the unicorn is the national animal of Scotland. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> All right, well, here we go. Spaghetto is the singular form of the word spaghetti. It is true. <laughs> All right, last one. A monkey was the first non-human to go into space. If it's true, you stand. False, you stay seated. It is a false. <laughs> Fruit flies were the first to make the trip. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that is all that I have. Um, just a quick reminder before we get started. Um, children ages five and under, there's childcare downstairs for you and you can go whenever. And if you are a child but older than five, there are some clipboards in the back of the sanctuary that you guys can grab with some coloring pages and all of that. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and pray for our evening and then we will get started. Jesus, we are so thankful to be able to come together as a church body and um, just enjoy some great fellowship time and um, learning about more about who you are and just different people in church history and just different areas of life to apply your word. I just ask that you would open all of our minds to be ready to receive and that you would be with all of the speakers and that they would just be guided by you and you would work in the hearts of all of us here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this is going to work this week. I have been, there we go. Aha, wonderful. All right, so this is the session about Bible backgrounds where we're taking some passages, um, hopefully familiar ones, and just kind of thinking through what are some of the background issues that help us understand them 
a little bit more. So it might be something to do with, with history or culture. Tonight, it's going to be something to do with geography. So one of the stories that shows up in all of the Gospels is the, the stories of the miraculous feeding of multitudes. Uh, Matthew and Mark tell us about two occasions. The first being the miraculous feeding of 5,000, and then the second being the miraculous feeding of 4,000. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about that. Uh, I think it's in Matthew... Uh, 13 and 14, and then Luke chapter 7, if you're trying to find the references later. Why would the gospel writers, when you think there is so much to write about Jesus, in fact, John tells us, right, there's, there's not enough books to contain all the things that Jesus did and said. So why would the gospel writers, with, with limited amount of space, tell us about two very similar stories? In fact, two stories, the thing, not only are they similar, but one actually seemed, the first one seems kind of more impressive. Right? Jesus feeds 5,000 men plus the women and kids who have been with them, their families. And not only that, but he can also feed 4,000. It's like, well, hold on a second. The 5,000 is actually kind of the harder thing to do. Right? So why do the Gospels that Mark and Matthew tell us about 5,000 and 4,000. I want to try to answer that for you tonight. Now, to do it, we have to have a little bit of a geography lesson. This is the Sea of Galilee. So if you're looking at a map of Israel, it's kind of up in the sort of the, the right corner of the map, typically sort of in the, the northeastern corner. This is the area where Jesus lived and did most of his ministry, kind of up in this sort of area. There's Capernaum right there. There's Bethsaida, which is going to be important for our story. Uh, he was over in this area off the map quite a bit. But uh, when he was around this lake on, on this side, we are in very much Jewish territory. This is where Jewish people lived. Um, in fact, a lot of his disciples came from the towns around this sort of area. Bethsaida, it's actually the home to, uh, is it Andrew and Peter, I think? And you'd have to go double check that. But I think that's home to them. It actually means the house of, of fish, which seems kind of weird because it's so far up. This is really was a sort of a swampy area, and so they could bring their boats quite far inland in order to be able to launch and sail and fish and do all those kind of things. Now, when Jesus feeds the first 5,000 people, he does it, oh, there we go, somewhere around there, which if I was to go back, thanks to the amazing machine we have, is somewhere along this coast. Uh, a couple of the gospel writers, I think it's actually John tells us that he does it in the region of Bethsaida. So he does it in a Jewish, Jewish sort of area. And when they collect the, uh, the extra containers of, of fish and bread that are left over, anyone remember the number of baskets of bread they collect? Twelve. Twelve. There we go. Very good. Twelve being often the number that represents the people of God, right? Twelve tribes, twelve apostles. When you see that number twelve, it's often kind of associated with, oh, this is the number of the people of God. So you collect twelve baskets because Jesus is feeding the people of God. Now, anyone remember how many baskets they collect after the 4,000? There's candy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Seven, right? So what's the seven? Seven is often the number of completeness, of perfection. So here's what's really interesting. Who do you think he fed when he was feeding the 4,000? Okay, we're going to answer this question as we walk through the Gospel of Mark in a little bit, he tells us, in the next minute. So Mark tells us that Jesus has done ministry, was doing ministry around this side of the lake, and he's around this side of the lake. He starts to do some very unusual things. He teaches that it's, it's okay to eat food that they thought was unclean. So the Jewish people are going, hold on a second, you can't eat that, you can't do that. She's like, no, it's all clean. And then he takes a trip. And for those of you who have been here on Sunday mornings, we've been talking about the regions of Sidon and Tyre. Jesus actually goes to that exact region, and there he, he takes care of a young girl who is not a Jewish girl. He's doing some very strange things in places that are not Jewish Israelite places, which, of course, causes some, some rather interesting discussions. And on his way back, Mark tells us he travels down here. Now I'm going to go one more. There we go. Okay, this map here. All right. There's the Sea of Galilee right there. There's the Jordan River. And this area is sort of the Galilee, the area where he was off. To, well, you see Nazareth there, Cana. He traveled and taught around this area. But we're told he comes back from Tyre. He comes all the way around, and he comes to the area of the Decapolis. Now, the Decapolis means 10. It's the area of 10 Roman cities. This is Gentile territory. And he comes to this area, and we are told he feeds a multitude, 4,000 strong, a people who would not have been Jewish people. In fact, after, they, after they've eaten, they, they say something like they want to glorify the God of Israel. 
right? Because they're not Israelites. These are Gentile people who are being fed by Jesus. So what does it all mean? I would say at least this much. Remember how Jesus in the, the end of Matthew tells us to we're go into all the world and preach the gospel? He didn't just tell us to do it. He showed us how to do it. He didn't just go to the Jewish people of Israel. He actually went to the Gentile people as well so that they would also know the glory of God. And that is our mission as God's people, not just to go to people like us. It's to go to all people because the gospel is for all of us. And that's a little bit of the background of the feeding of the multitudes. again. Can you hear me? Okay. So today we are talking about how God made you. So I believe that part of gaining control and confidence in your finances is understanding yourself and how God made you. And if you're married, this can be super helpful in understanding each other and ultimately getting on the same page. Knowing ourselves can help us to appreciate what we're good at and to learn to work outside our natural tendencies when necessary. So I look at how we handle money as nature versus nurture. There's two sides of it. There's how God made us and there's um, how we were raised. And so next time we'll talk about how we were raised. And today we are talking about our money personality, which is part of your DNA and it is how God made you. And there are five money personalities. There is a spender, saver, risk taker, security seeker, and flyer. And kids, you can even tell um, what your money personality is by how you handle your Halloween candy. The spender eats it quickly. The saver saves it. The risk taker trades it. The security seeker sorts it. And the flyer gives it away. And that picture is from my family room floor from this past. Halloween. It was, I think it was one of Vivian's friends. Um, so I believe that every money personality shows aspects of God's personality. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So first off, the spender. This is me. Uh, we get a rush out of spending. We live in the moment. We love to buy things for other people. Um, we can be the budget breakers. And we make a great partner because they will never let finances get in the way of truly living life to the fullest. And just so you know, I'm going to kind of skip these because five minutes is really short. Um, saver. The saver gets a genuine rush from saving, and this is not me. Sometimes I wish it was. Um, they rarely spend impulsively. They're a true, or they can be a joy stealer. They can be a little cheap. Um, so the, this last Christmas, we got our kids a Ferrero Rocher for every day of their advent calendar. And Nick is a saver, and he, his plan was to just save them all till the end. And I was like, I had to convince him, no, just enjoy them day by day because you're just going to get more candy on Christmas and you don't need to save these. Risk taker. They listen to their guts. They're a big picture person. They're always looking for the next adventure. They get excited about possibility. But they can also be blinded by possibility. They make a great spouse because they are always thinking about the future. Security seeker, this is also me. So everybody has two money personalities, a primary and a secondary, and this is my secondary. They will sacrifice today for tomorrow. They do their research, they prepare, they're prepared with a plan, but they can be overly negative to new ideas. Um, they can get stuck in a research rut. Randy and I are very good at that. Um, makes, they make a great spouse because they plan carefully and will be prepared for any disaster. And last but not least, there is the flyer. And they honestly don't think about money. They don't stress about money. They're content with life. They're happy to let someone else take care of their finances. Um, but they can be a little disorganized. They can kind of lack skills to solve their money problems. But they make a great spouse because they are easygoing and will never be controlling on money issues. So 
Because you have a primary and a secondary money personality, you often have an opposite dynamic. You often have a spendy personality and a savvy personality, and those can kind of cause some internal conflict, some buyer's remorse. Um, so often we take that um, internal conflict and we kind of blame our spouse. Um, it can also cause conflict between um, you and your spouse, um, but ultimately, the idea is to understand each other and see how you balance each other out. Um, so I have eight seconds left. I, if you want this presentation, um, you can talk to me or Andrew, because I'm going to kind of skip. There's some questions here that you can discuss with your partner. Um, it's important not to criticize people's money personality, because it is part of who you are, and it does hurt to be criticized for who you are. Um, but you also need to learn to work outside your money personality, too. Um, and I just love this quote, so I'm going to finish with that. There are few gifts a couple can give each other greater than the joy that comes from feeling known and understood. And that is Dr. John Gottman. Um, oh, and if you want to know what your money personality is, you can go to 5moneypersonalities.com and take the quiz. There's also more info at themoneycouple.com. And there's a quiz there for kids and a quiz there for teens. So that is your homework. Good evening, and I told you tonight you were going to have a chance to meet Stephanie. So this, everyone, is Stephanie Giesbrick. Say hello to Stephanie. <laughs> all right. So, all right, Stephanie, I'm just going to ask you a couple questions, and then I'll pass you the mic. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, and I was raised in Pembroke, Saskatchewan, which if you don't know where that is, that is the Miller campus out in Saskatchewan, and my parents are on staff there. Okay, when did you make a commitment to follow Christ? I first decided to follow the Lord when I was three or four years old. Um, it was Christmas Eve at my grandparents' house after hearing the Christmas story. Um, and, but it wasn't until I was 14 when I spent the summer at camp that I rededicated my life to Christ and my faith really became my own. And I was baptized that summer. Okay, so what did you do after you graduated from high school? I went straight to Bible school. I went out to Sunnybrae Miller, and I spent three years there, and I graduated in April. Okay. What are some of your impressions of BC after living on the prairies? I fell in love real fast. <laughs> The mountains just like screamed adventure to me, and it was beautiful. I just lived in such an awe for a really long time of God's creation and just the beauty out here. And there's also a bit of like a culture difference of Saskatchewan and BC, and I really enjoy that. Awesome. Okay, so um, what was your very first job that you received a paycheck for? It was the summer between my grade 11 and 12 year, and I worked at a hotel. I was a housekeeper, cleaning hotel rooms, and I was very sad that summer because I was working and all my friends went to camp. <laughs> okay, what drew you to ministry here at Emmanuel? It's a little bit of a long story, so to keep it short, um, I had other ministry plans that I was going to be doing that fell through. And so as I was praying and asking God, like, what on earth am I supposed to do now? Um, I knew that the church hired interns, and I didn't know anything about it. And so I just emailed them and was like, hey, is this a possibility? Um, what would this even look like? And the Lord kept opening doors and providing. And I'm here now, and I'm really excited about it. And I'm excited to meet all of you and be a part of this team. Okay, if you could travel anywhere, can you think of three places that you would like to visit? I would love to go to Europe 
which is like super broad. But my dream is to take like three or four months and just like travel around to different countries and just see as much as I possibly can. I also would love to go to the Middle East and see like all the biblical and historical places. Um, I think that would be really cool. And also New Zealand has always been on my list as it's beautiful and I have a friend who lives there. So one of these days, I'm gonna make it out there. All right, finally, what do you enjoy doing when you have some free time on your hands? I really love just hanging out with my friends and going for coffee and that's really about it. I don't have like a specific hobby that I do all the time, but yeah, that's about it. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. We look forward to getting to know Stephanie and tune in next week to see who we interview then. All right. Awesome. We are going to continue on talking about the Trinity. And so just by way of review, uh, last week's word, feel free. Um, yeah, I should say we're doing the five key words. So last week's word was the word one. Um, and it's really important. It's an important word because the Bible makes it clear that there is one God. And so again, through history, if you were to look into that Trinity conversation, there's been times where people have tried to sort of take away the hardness of understanding the Trinity. And um, just even by saying, well, if there was more than one God, then that would solve part of the sort of the dilemma. But you read, and even this verse, as we looked at last week, where God makes it clear, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And so, uh, again, that was a key verse, especially in the Old Testament, Testament for the, those people in particular. And so then coming into the New Testament, um, how did we get then to where people believed in Jesus and where people attributed to Jesus uh, just praise and worship that was only worthy of God. Because that's what our verse says, right? It's who God is, he's one. And then how we respond to that. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And so this God is demanding or deserving of all of our praise and all of our worship. And so um, a question that might be helpful with that. Remember when Jesus stilled the storm? Jesus, I believe he was in the boat with the disciples. They're fearful for their life. They wake up Jesus, Jesus stills the storm, and the disciples say something to the effect of what manner or what kind of man is this? And it's really the question of what category are they basically saying, normal people don't do this, right? And so they recognize that there's something about Jesus that is not ordinary um, because he is divine. And not really, that's the word that might help us today. It's the word substance. Um, so the first word was one. Today's word is substance. Um, and really what we're trying to get at, when we talk about the word substance, there's two kind of key concepts. It's that fundamental unity. So what we're saying is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all equally of the same substance. They're all equally divine. They're all equally God. So there's that fundamental unity. Um, and so then it's also that word fully divine and fully one. And so what we're saying by that is that the Father is not, does not have more of the godly nature than the Son or that the Holy Spirit has less than the Father. We're not saying that. We're saying that all of them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when you look through Scripture, you see just that reality where they're all fully divine. They're all, they all have that same substance, or in essence, they are fully God. Um, and so um, let's just, uh, yeah, these, I want to look at three passages that just kind of bring this, this out. Uh, so this was Jesus, um, and the Pharisees had came to him and said, tell us plainly, are you the Christ? Um, and so there's actually a ton packed into John 10. You should go look at it when you go home. But essentially, Jesus says, you wouldn't believe me even if I told you. I gave eternal life. And he says other things as well. But part of that, he says, I and the Father are one. And so it's at that point, you, you probably read it already. It says, the, Jew, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And then the Jews answer him, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. So those Pharisees, those Jews that were around about him, they understood what Jesus was saying. He was saying that he was one with God. He was fully divine. And so it was for that, that, that they were wanting to stone him because he, would, he assumed, or in their mind, presumed to be divine. Um, yeah. 
Another verse that just kind of highlights again the, the, the divinity of the Holy Spirit, even here where you see sort of these Trinitarian expressions, you know, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so that was the other thing. When the early church was just thinking through this, it was to see these kind of verses that just where you see the Father, Son, and the Spirit all on equal level. There's one more. There's piles of these verses. I'm just picking three uh, just to highlight them, but there's, there's tons more. So Acts 5, remember when Ananias and Sapphira, they sell the property, they keep money back, they lie about it. So then they're confronted. And so what has filled your heart? Or Peter says, what has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? You have not lied to man, but to God. And so it's in that context that they lied uh, to the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. Um, I want to tell you. So let's jump forward to, let me think this. So 325 AD, it was the Council of Nicaea. I'm sure you're excited on the edge of your seat with the thought of that. Um, But it was a pretty big deal. And there's a big debate that was raging on. And and it was really affecting like the Christendom and that area at that time. And so um, what was interesting was you've got kind of the two sides who were going head to head, uh, Arius and then Athanasius. And Arius, he had come up with this kind of theology where he was saying Jesus is not God. He was created, that was what he was saying. And he said he's a special creation uh, and that's why he deserves worship. He's unique in his creation, but he is still created. Um, And Athanasius was having none of it. He was saying, no, that's not how it is. Uh, That's not what the Bible says. And one of Athanasius' point was that um, ultimately, how could a creature die to save people from their sins, right? And so that was kind of where it came down to. That was part of it as well. But interestingly, they get into this, uh, which if you've ever been to Bible school, you've probably done a couple of seminars in this. For those who are quick, you'll realize there's only one letter of difference, and that's what the debate raged over, because Arius tried to come up with a compromise, and so the bottom word, um, it says, of similar substance, right? So not of the same substance, but of similar substance. Might even have it, yeah, there. Um, And Athanasius, he debated, and this council, this meeting went back and forth. You might say, well, there's typical church debating over one letter of difference. Um, But no, it made a huge difference in terms of who Christ was. And so the church, again, even up to this point, the consensus had been that it was the top one. It was off the same substance. But after that there, the church again just galvanized in that place of saying, no, Jesus is fully God. He is of the same substance to the Father and equal to the Father in every way and worthy of praise. And so one was our word from last week, really important. Substance is our word for today. And we'll continue on next week. Hello, my name is Amanda Queering, and I lead sword keepers at the church, and we memorize scripture with actions. So um, first, I'm just going to say, so last week, the verse we learned was a verse calling us to worship and feel joy, which which results in joyful actions like serving and singing. So the next part we're going to learn is a verse that gives us a reason to worship by calling us to know truths about God which result in our praise and adoration of him again in the next verse. And it's a pattern that goes through. So we'll talk about this each week as we go through, but there's a a repeating pattern in this uh, psalm. So you can stand up on your feet and we'll review what we learned last week and then we'll start the next one. Um, Last week, partway through, right near the end, I kind of cracked up because a kid just suddenly appeared in the aisle doing the actions. So if you have a kid who can't see through the grown-ups, send them out to the aisles if you want or whatever so they can see. Ready? Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Let's do that again. Ready? Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. So we're not called to just worship blindly, but to know. We're to know things about God that lead us into that worship. So know that the Lord, he is God. He is strong. He's all powerful. He's the creator. Let's do that together. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us. 
So we are not accidents. We're not just little blobs that happens by mistake. We are created intentionally, each one of us. So we're going to do this. Like, imagine you've got a big blob of Play-Doh in your hands, and you're making it like this blob, blob. Okay? It is he who has made us, and we are his. We belong to him. He made us intentionally. Let's go. It is he who has made us. It is he who has made us, and we are his. Go from no. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people. And that idea of being a people is people who live in the same area, fellow countrymen, a group of people with something in common. And we, as the family of God, are his people. So we're doing this circle, like we're all tied together through commonality in the family of God. Ready? We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. From Christmas, the kids who did it, or the adults who learned at Christmas, this is my word for shepherd. So you're holding a shepherd's staff. So sheep of his pasture. So it's like we're showing all the rolling lush green fields. And I love the beautiful poetry that is in the Psalms, especially of the sheep and the pasture, and that dependence and connection relationship of sheep and shepherd. Um, So we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Let's go from uh, know that the Lord. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Right from the top, ready? Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. 48 seconds, one more time. (laughs) Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord. All the earth, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Good job. Uh, Full disclosure, before I start, I happen to be a young earth creationist. There's old earth creationists. Um, It is in the doctrine of salvation, so I love to discuss it, but I don't push it. So, (laughs) Um, how many of you were told when you were in high school, university, graduate school, that the earth is billions of years old based on radiometric dating? Put your hand up. Y'all remember hearing that? Okay, well, there's a few things that they didn't tell you. And when I was at university, and they didn't tell me, and it was fun having discussions with the professors. But uh, there's about 40 different types of radiometric dating. There's only five, basically five that are are used. Um, Potassium decays to what's called argon-40. Rubidium-87 decays to strontium-87. There's radiocarbon dating. Um, There's uranium, two types of uranium dating that they use that decays to to lead. You've got uranium-238, and that decays to lead-206. Uranium-235, that decays to lead-207. So the whole dating system is based on uh, a ratio of what's called a parent isotope and a daughter isotope. An isotope is basically um, an atom uh, of the same, it's the same element, but it's got variations to it. So you'd have carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14 atoms. So the variation is the 12, 13, and um, 14. Uh, So what they do is they'll take a rock 
And, oh, and it's metamorphic um, rock or igneous rock. You can't do it with sedimentary rock. I'll explain a little bit, a bit of that later. And what they'll do is they'll measure the ratio between what's called a parent isotope and a daughter isotope. And they know what a decay rate, what the decay rate of that um, element is and how long it takes for that to take place. So if you picture an hourglass and uh, it's flipped upside down and you've got the parent isotope in the top and the daughter isotope in the bottom and you start that hourglass and you know what the decay rate is, and that ratio is what they measure between the parent and the daughter. But they make some assumptions in doing that, um, but they don't tell you at school. These are the, there's three main assumptions that they have. One is that the decay rate is constant. It never changes. It's always the same. Uh, the other assumption is that there was no um, daughter isotope present at the time of the formation of that rock. And um, the third one is that there's been no contamination of any kind that goes into the, those rocks. So when I worked, I worked years ago for a company called Minerax Corporation, and we were doing some uranium surveys in uh, New Brunswick. And uh, a perfect example of how something can, can be contaminated is um, we would come along, uh, we, we, we used a thing called a scintillometer, and we'd be measuring gamma rays. And uh, when, when a, an element decays, it lets, shoots off particles. So when, you know, you ever, you ever heard of a Geiger counter? And you know, you hear that clicking, and it gets really loud and fast. Well, those, that's measuring particles that are coming off um, this element. So we would get to a water reservoir, and our, our instruments would just go way up, really, really loud and strong and r really great readings. And well, that's because the, the elements were being washed out of the rock and pooling in these pools. So you have the contamination um, in that sense where how do you know you've got an accurate reading if something has been either added to that rock by contamination or it's come out of that rock by contamination. You don't. How do you, dis how do you measure whether there was any of the daughter isotope present at the time of the formation? You don't know that, right? How do you know that the decay rate has been constant? You don't know that. So my point being in all of this with 16 seconds left, you can ask me questions later if you have any, is with those three unknowns, you have no idea how old those rocks really are. So you, you're being fed a bit of a, a story. So anyway, there we go. <laughs> I got through the first sheet. Last week, I was telling you a story about a lady who was born in Northern Ireland. Her name was Maud. She went to a memorial service for four missionaries who had been killed in the Congo the previous year. And at that service, they had asked for volunteers to replace the missionaries who had been killed the previous year in the Congo, uh, 1964 rebellion in Congo. And she felt ca God calling her to do that. But if you might remember, she knew her parents would, dis would uh, d disapprove. Her parents would not approve. But despite her parents' disapproval, Maud had applied and had started her training at WEC Missionary Organization, which is Worldwide Evangelization for Christ. It was a missionary organization. So Maud had started her missionary training and she went to the WEC leaders and said, I believe that God is calling me to go to the Congo. And they turned to her and they said, Maud, no, the doors for the Congo have closed. No missionaries are, entered, are, are allowed to enter or are able to go there. You'll have to choose a different country. But by the time she had done her language school and her missionary training and a, di a tropical a disease, um, a course in tropical diseases, um, the doors for the Congo had reopened and she was able to um, app apply and they were able to send her to the Congo. So Maud arrived in the Congo in 1968. Um, she sailed by boat for two weeks. And when the boat arrived um, into this little area, she remembers thinking, I must remember this site. And if you remember, so 1968 is actually for some 
some of you, that's, well, for all of us, it's not that long ago, okay? And so running water and electricity were invented by this stage, but YouTube and the National Geogra and, the, and the Travel Channel have not been invented by this stage. So she had never seen pictures of the Congo and what she was walking into. Um, as she entered into that little, uh, into the, the mouth of that river, there was a group of mud huts and a lot of palm trees. A lot of palm trees, I should say. Mon was there for three years, and she had determined that she would not go home before her term was over. So a term was five years with WEC, and she had said, no matter what, even if it kills me, I will not return home until I have done my five years in the Congo. So she was three years into her term with the parents who were still not approving of what she was doing, and she received a letter from her father to say, Maud, your mother has just had a stroke. She is not going to recover. It is your duty as a daughter and a nurse to come home and take care of your mother. So Maud was torn because she had determined not to go home and here she was um, devastated the idea of, of losing her mom and not being able to be there. So every day Maud had a, 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 um, a practice of getting up very early and reading her, her Bible. And as she was torn with this decision before her, um, as she was just settling into life in the Congo, she turned to Genesis 28 and read the story of Jacob and it said, um, it was this little verse that spoke to her, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. And that verse gave Maud the peace to leave before her first term in the Congo was over and to go home and nurse her mom, um, who was terminally ill at that stage. Maud returned to Northern Ireland, cared for her mom. Her mom died a few years, a few months, sorry, after she arrived home. And her father turned to her and her father said, Maud, I cannot take care of myself. It is your responsibility to take care of me right now in my old age. And Maud was torn, but for seven years she cared for her father. And I think it was six weeks before her di he died, she was able to lead her, her father to the Lord. And it was just a few weeks before her mom died that he, she was also able to lead her mom to the Lord. So she was able to return to the Congo seven years after, um, uh, after her little time in Northern Ireland. Maud finally returned to the Congo and was sent to a little village called Molita. Molita was a remote village in the middle of the rainforest. There was no running water or electricity. It is um, a very unpopulated, it is very isolated and po possibly of one of the poorer areas. For various reasons, the missionaries before Maud had either died or retired or left. And so she was actually going to go to this village and she was gonna be the only missionary there. And the closest, she's brought a little radio and the closest missionaries were 120 kilometers away and they were Wycliffe missionaries. So her all-important radio transmitter, transmitter was powered by a car battery, which was kept charged by a solar panel, panel unless the rain hid the sun. She was very conscious of the Lord's presence. In Melita, there was a little church, a little school, a Bible school, and a leprosy camp. And Maud was involved with all of these things. She taught at the Bible school. She was involved with the Sunday's church services. She was working at the hospital. Um, and when Maud first became a missionary, she was sure she would have to give up nursing so that she could be a missionary, and God called her to do both. So when Maud arrived in Molita, they said to her that many of the mothers who were coming to have babies were dying. Would, Ma, would Maud train more, um, train, more, train, more, train more midwives? And they showed Maud the hospital, and the hospital was a mud hut with mud floors and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and leaves for a ceiling. And Maud knew that you couldn't keep that clean and sanitary, and she knew that you could not keep rats out of a building with a, with a leaf roof, and so that needed to be changed immediately. They came to her door and they, she told them, we need to make, um, we need to make bricks, it needs to be a cement building. And they came to her door and they said, this brick machine has been hidden in the forest for 30 years, but we believe it still works. So this the woman who was born in the country, who was trained as a missionary, um, started working this brick machine with the people in Molita that made two bricks at a time using the clay from the anthills. And they needed an operating room, a surgical room, and they needed a place for the women to deliver their babies. And they started making two bricks at a time to build these buildings. So if you remember, when Maud was wanting to go to the Congo, it wasn't safe enough to do, for her to do so, and so she was told she couldn't go. And I, but it was never always safe in the Congo. And so as she was making this, um, they continued to, over time, to build this building, um, she got a, uh, a, a radio message one day that said, Maud, it is very unsafe in the Congo. An airplane is coming in an hour to come and pick you out to evacuate out of Malita. Maud wasn't convinced that it was dangerous because there was no fighting in her, com her exact area. And so she had, would have no time to say goodbye and no time to pack anything up. So she was not convinced what she, that she needed to leave. And you'll have to come back next week to find out what she does. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so tonight, tonight uh, we're talking about communication. Is my mic working? How about now? Okay, great. So tonight we're talking about communication, uh, but Amy didn't tell me what to say. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, communication is something that Amy and I work on often. It might be one of the more challenging parts of keeping a healthy marriage. At least it has been for us. Yeah. My wounding has negatively impacted healthy communication with Marcus. I tend to shut down and not say anything when hurt or upset. The root of that is the lie that what I have to say doesn't matter, so there's no point in saying anything. We had to both work on an at building an atmosphere of trust. We had to be also be both okay with saying what was bothering us without worrying about paying the price of, it, of expressing our feelings. I grew up in an environment where I paid the price for expressing my feelings, and I had to learn that Marcus wanted to know how I felt because he loves me. I had to start trusting him. Ephesians 4.15 says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We can tell our spouse the truth in love, building one another up, which is evidence of our maturity in Christ, and we can speak the, in love with our, to our spouse and still not budge from the truth, which is much easier said than done. <laughs> For example, sometimes Amy needs to tell me I'm being a jerk, but uh, she can say it in a loving way. Either way, I'll get the hint, but it'd be nice if she said it, said it kindly. <laughs> Growing up, I didn't have a good example of what healthy communication looked like. Uh, either. So Amy and I just continue to hurt each other with words or lack of words. We are bent towards being the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Even without wounds, we have a sinful nature and need the help of the Holy Spirit. John 1.14 tells us that Jesus was full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the only, one, the, the glory of the only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So as you're talking, speak with grace and truth. Make sure your spouse knows you see your togetherness as a team effort. Ensure, ensure she knows you're committed to your marriage. When addressing issues, try to see your spouse's side of the things. For, for example, I know you've been really busy lately, but I'd appreciate it if you help me get, uh, get the dinner ready for, for tonight. Or I know how your mood is affect, or I love, I love how you care for our family, but I need to talk to you about how your mood is affecting our home. So you're recognizing a strength or something your spouse is dealing with first rather than just complaining or nagging. Grace comes from a heart that gives the sp your spouse the benefit of the doubt instead of thinking the worst of them. When Marcus says something that hurts my feelings, now remember, he needs a little bit of help in the compassion department, I can choose to think that he intentionally wanted to hurt me or I can remember that he adores me and likely had no idea that his comment hurt my feelings. I must remember his character. When I tell him how I feel about what he said or did, he usually confirms that he had no idea what he said or did was hurtful. How many of you guys can relate to that? <laughs> Don't be threatened by the truth. If the truth. If the truth threatens you, that's a red flag that something's up. Maybe something needs to be addressed by God. Maybe some healing needs to happen. One of the best things I've done was sit down with Amy and ask her some hard questions about our marriage, like, when do you feel most loved and appreciated? Or is there anything hindering our closeness right now? And do we have a Christ-centered marriage? If we manage to make time to deal with issues properly, we could resolve many of them. If we do not intentionally make the time to, to talk about our issues, those issues will likely become a big deal. And problems can't get resolved in a five-minute gap between getting home from work and dinner. If Amy and I don't have time to talk to each other, our priorities are wrong. We would need to give something up, whether that be a friendship that's taking too much time or working in the garage or gaming or whatever, whatever is taking up my time, or simply coming home from work promptly will leave more time for communication. A good rule of thumb is to devote 30 to 60 minutes every day for communication. You can talk about anything. Maybe you heard something funny, share that with your spouse. Perhaps something has broken your heart, share that with your spouse. Talk about the kids or about your day, ask them about his. This time doesn't have to be one hour all at once, and you don't need to set a timer, but just take the time to talk. One of my favorite times to chat with Marcus is when he's making dinner. Yes, he's the cook. <laughs> and if I'm helping him, we'll talk while I chop the veggies or do whatever he's asked me to do, or I'll just sit at the table and talk to him. Another time we talk is while we're cleaning the bathroom. Some great topics have come up as he scrubs the toilet. <laughs> 
And guys, don't be like Kevin from the show The Office and think, why waste time to say lot word when few words do trick? <laughs> but seriously, have, have a few minutes of intimate communication time every day. And this doesn't have to be with just words, you know. Show both physical and verbal affection. Marriage wasn't meant to be a business relationship. And without fun and physical intimacy, that's pretty much what marriage is, a lousy business relationship. One of my favorite things is when Marcus wraps his arms around me. That tells me everything that I need to know. I am secure, I am loved, and I am cherished. Another way Amy and I have intimate communication is by flirting. I don't think a day goes by where, where at least one of us isn't flirting with the other. And if it's been a while since you flirted with your spouse, make it a point of starting tonight. We trained our children to respect our relationship. We didn't let our children dominate our lives. Our family did not revolve around them. If our children controlled our marriage, it wouldn't be healthy for them or for us. When the kids were young, we'd put them to bed, read stories, and have those quiet moments with them. And then it was bedtime, and they had to stay in bed. The time after bedtime was mommy and daddy time, and they were not to interrupt it. They understood how important this time was for us. In a few years, the last of our kids will be out of the house. And if communication was something that we didn't work on, our house will be pretty quiet when it's just the two of us. Healthy communication takes some work, but it is well worth it for a strong marriage. So make talking to your spouse every day a priority this week to help you check your email or the church website this week for some discussion prompts. Thanks. I haven't graduated to a headset yet, so I'll have to hang on to this. Um, <clears throat> By grace, you are saved through faith in Christ. Uh, last week, we just really took a, a quick look um, at grace. So that brings us to saved, um, which I think ought to um, cause us a few questions. Um, who needs to be saved? Why do I need to be saved? What do I need to be saved from? Um, so that's what I'm going to try to just tackle really briefly here tonight uh, with, a, I guess, a little, uh, a little caveat or a little warning that um, this isn't actually, this is the bad news part of the good news. Um, <clears throat> the gospel is good news, but God confronts us with the bad news first. And, uh, and he doesn't hold back. Um, he tells us uh, what we are, what our state is. Um, and it wouldn't be faithful at all to the word of God to just ignore it. <clears throat> um, I want to get to uh, the glorious part of the gospel too. I'm looking forward to uh, the weeks coming up, but, um, but just bear with me that tonight's subject's a little heavier. Um, two quotes from Charles Spurgeon, just to sort of set the tone. We must all learn to hear what we do not like. The question is not, is it pleasant, but is it true? And Jesus Christ will not tone down the truth of Scripture to suit your carnal taste. So what do we need to be saved from? Yes, um, we need to be saved from the power and the penalty of sin. Uh, Jesus said that he who sins is a slave to sin, and Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. But ultimately, we need to be saved from the wrath of God. Um, Romans 5, Thess 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 22, Matthew 25, and on and on. Um, God's word speaks to us about the wrath of God. Um, <clears throat> who? Who needs to be saved? Well, just listen to the testimony of Scripture. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes. From Isaiah 64, each of us has become like something unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all wither like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And Jesus in John 8 said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. I think we often 
Um, we often struggle to accept the clear biblical instruction that there is no one righteous, that no one is good. Uh, we kind of, we tend to think of people as being good if they are uh, moderately decent or civil. And in doing so, we fail to understand God's perfection and that the first principle of righteousness is actually fear for God and love for God. Uh, just consider this quote um, from John Calvin. The principal part of rectitude is wanting when there is no zeal for the glory of God. And there is no such zeal in those whom he has not regenerated by his spirit. The virtues which deceive us by an empty show may have their praise in civil society and the common intercourse of life. But before the judgment seat of God, they will be of no value to establish a claim of righteousness. Or Robert Hayes said, the fundamental human sin is the refusal to honor God and to give him thanks. So I think it's prudent for us to look at the wrath of God in light of his attributes. Um, particularly, I'm thinking of righteousness, justice, and love. Um, and remembering that these things are not things that God strives after. These are things that God is. God doesn't try to be righteous. God is righteous. God doesn't try to be just. God is just. Now, as to God's righteousness, uh, we see his wrath manifest as a separation of himself with that which is unrighteous. And this is the theme we read about in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, the apostle starts, um, he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, suppress their un or who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, this is in the context he has just said in verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation for all who believe, first for the Jew and the Gentile. So he's speaking to us about salvation, and he comes up right away with the problem. Why do we need that salvation? And he's saying this is the wrath of God which is being revealed. So what we're looking at is clearly the wrath of God. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And then verse 24 says, therefore God gave them up. Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. So in regards to righteousness, we see this pattern of God turning man over to his sin and the consequences of his sin. Um, God doesn't make him evil, but neither does he rescue him. He leaves him alone. Of course, the end result is death, because when you're separated from the source of life, you die. Now, Bear that in mind, I think at least it's encouraging. Bear that in mind when you're reading in places like Proverbs chapter 3 or Hebrews chapter 12, where he says, God disciplines those he loves. And consider the contrast, the distinction that's there, where those God has set his affection on, he actually disciplines them to draw him close to himself as opposed to just leaving them alone. <clears throat> now, what about God's justice? Um, we hear Abraham's declaration in Genesis 18, will not the judge of all the earth do right? So scripture testifies that we are sinners by nature and by nature objects of wrath, meaning that it's actually what we are, not just something that we do that is corrupt. But we're not passive in our unrighteousness, right? We do things. Um, out of the overflow of wicked hearts, come wicked thoughts and wicked words and wicked deeds. And the Bible is clear that God will hold everyone accountable for this. 2 Thessalonians 1, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer this punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Or Revelation 22, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. So there's almost a sense in which in God's righteousness, we see his wrath revealed passively. I hope that's not a, 
misleading word, but in the, in the turning over to sin and we see in his justice, his wrath exercised actively in punishing transgressions. Oh, I went over. Um, okay, I was gonna touch on love. I can't, I'm sorry. Um, so in short, I, I was avoiding that. Um, why do we need to be saved? <clears throat> Because every last person is dead in trespasses and sin without hope and at enmity with God. Because we have no means to save ourselves. We have no ability to change our natures. We have no power to commence living righteously. We have no way to atone for our transgressions. We have no merit of our own to stand justified before Almighty God. All right, last but not least, the story of Augustine. If you remember last year, last week, last year, last week, we left Augustine about age 18. Uh, I wasn't able to show you any uh, pictures last week because the machine was finicky. There's a artist depiction of what he looked like near the end of his life. Um, so we left him at the age of 18. Oh, by the way, there's some great quotes. I was actually kind of curious. I've, I gather not many people are actually familiar with a lot of what he wrote, which we will deal with in a couple weeks' time. But um, some of his quotes are quite, uh, quite influential. So some of you who have read philosophy and ever read some of them, uh, you've probably come across some of the things he has said before, like truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. You let it loose. It'll defend itself. That's uh, Augustine. Anyway, we left him off last week, 18, living in the city of Carthage, where he had met a young servant girl who he took to be essentially his common-law wife. He had had a child by the time he was about 17 or 18. He had rejected everything that his mom, who was a believer, stood for, and he was living for the good life. Now, if you remember last week, Augustine was brilliant. He actually learned to read, reading Greek philosophers. So as a very young child, uh, his parents invested heavily in his education so that he could be a very wealthy lawyer. Uh, his ambition was actually to be sort of the right-hand man of the Caesar of the entire Roman Empire. So very ambitious. He wanted to be wealthy. He was also a very, um, very gregarious, very likable guy, so very popular, had lots of friends. Uh, and it got him in a lot of trouble. Uh, and I am rushing over most of what that trouble is because uh, just it's a, we're in a room full of all ages. Uh, you can fill in the gaps with what you think that would look like. But uh, by the time he was 18, he joined a cult. Now, the cult he joined was started by a man by the name of Manny. Manny, who uh, lived uh, around 220 to 30 A.D., taught people that he was the Holy Spirit. So he had this weird religious idea that he was the Holy Spirit and he would tell people what to believe. His essential belief was there were two gods, one good God and one bad God. And Augustine really, this appealed to him because his big problem that he couldn't solve was, how do you solve the problem of evil? there's a good God. If God is good and there's evil in the world, how do you make sense of that? And so uh, Manny just had this great solution. There's a good God and there was a bad God. The good God's responsible for good things. The bad God's responsible for bad things. And Augustine really liked it. Not only did it sort of make sense, it also got him off the hook because the belief worked like that. If you do something bad, it's not your fault. It's the bad God made you do it. So Augustine just continued to live a terrible life. He actually followed the teachings of this cult group for about nine years, all through his 20s. During that time, he was incredibly successful. Uh, you, it's hard to sort of underestimate the rapid rise of Augustine through the Roman Empire. He was teaching at Carthage. He found that he, he came to the point where the people in Carthage he thought were sort of like backwoods type people. And so he decided to go to Rome. He moved to Rome. He started his own school there teaching. Um, something funny happened to him. In Rome, there was a tradition when you enrolled for like school or university, you didn't pay your tuition up front, you paid at the end of the year. So people would go to school, get to the end of the year, and then just not pay. And this was his school, this was his income, so he only stayed a year. During that year, he became very good friends with a very influential Roman man, a very pagan, very anti-Christian man, who was very concerned about the rise of Christianity in the city of Milan. Um, we had a map. Uh, no, Oh, that, that's kind of cool. That's a tree that Augustine planted. Uh, it's an olive tree. It's big. There we go. There's the Roman Empire. So uh, this is northern Africa. Uh, Carthage is about there. 
He's moved up to Rome, and he's going to go to Milan shortly because in Milan, there was a teaching position, very, very influential teaching position. And this man in Rome, the pagan man who befriended Augustine, didn't want Christianity to spread. And there was a preacher in Milan by the name of Ambrose who was very influential, preaching the gospel, many people coming to understand who God is through his preaching. And so this this pagan Roman said, I'm going to send Augustine to Milan because I'll make sure that Christianity doesn't spread because Augustine is never going to become a Christian. Christian. Send them to Milan. Now, remember, Augustine was very much into rhetoric and speaking, and he, he had heard that Ambrose was a brilliant speaker. He did not go to church because he wanted to learn anything about God. He went to church just because he wanted to hear this great speaker preach. And you know what God did. Over the next couple of years, from about the age 30 to the age 32, he would kept going back to church, not just on Sundays to hear the sermons. He started meeting with Ambrose. Ambrose started to share with him about Jesus Christ, about who God is. And over the course of two years, Augustine describes it as an intellectual conversion. He came to believe the truths of what was being taught. But he would talk about later his moral conversion. In other words, he believed it in his head and not in his heart. In the late summer, fall of the year what were we, about 368, somewhere, 366, or 386, sorry. Uh, He quit his job, he stopped teaching, and he went to the countryside for six months to just try to figure out what life was all about. He took his mom, who had come, his mom followed him from North Africa, Uh, she was there to marry him to a good Christian girl. The the lady who he was with, she booted him back to, uh, to North Africa, she was Determined, if he just married a good Christian girl, everything would be fine. Um, So he took this six months, and while he was during this six months, there is a very famous story. Uh, One day, he was in a garden. It's the garden story. There's some pretty famous key stories in Augustine's life. One is the pear story, where he stole all the pears. This is the second, when he was in a garden, and he heard a voice. And the voice, he said, was like the sound of a child. And it said, take and read, take and read. What is going on? The only thing he could conclude is that somehow he needed to find a Bible. And he opened a Bible. Have you ever done this where you just opened a Bible to like, what's the, what's the first verse you see? And maybe that's a significant verse. Here is the verse that he opened up to, Romans 13, 13 to 14. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess and lust, not in quarreling and jealousy. Rather, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You could not have gotten a more appropriate verse for Augustine than that one. This was a man who had committed his life to any pleasure he could find. And all of a sudden, God's word told him, set that all aside, put on Christ. And that was the moment he gave his life to the Lord. He was baptized the next Easter, and he decided at that point it was time to head back to North Africa. And I'm just going to end with this real quick story. As they were waiting for the ship to sail to North Africa, there was a civil war in the Roman Empire. They weren't able to travel right away. His mother who had come, her name was Monica, um, she got a, a significant fever, and she passed away in five days. He got to the end as... As he wrote of that moment, and I'll finish just with this quote. He says, I closed her eyelids. I had sorrow beyond measure. It would have overflowed into tears, but by a strong effort of will, I had no tears. It was not fitting her funeral should be conducted with moaning and weeping, such as normal when death is only seen as misery or as the complete end. But she had not died in misery, and death was not the end. And at that point, he was able to to leave his mother and travel back to North Africa, and we will pick up the rest of the story next week to find out what does, what does Augustine do with the rest of his life. Uh, we are done for tonight. There's just one little quick thing. Anita, is this actually your birthday? It, it is. Yeah, every once in a while, we get it wrong. So Anita was at church this morning at 5 for Faith tonight. If you remember last week, Anita was up here with Ray, and today is her birthday, and she spent the whole day basically with us as a church family. We need to sing for Anita. <laughs> It would just seem very appropriate. Now, I'm, I'm going to mute the mic here, but uh, someone with a better voice than me needs to, uh, to lead out and help us. Uh, Randy, are you our guy? Could you just give us like a starting?
I hope it was no one else's birthday and we missed it. If it is, there's no way you're going to admit it right now, right? Uh, let me pray for you and then we're done. Father, it has been a joy to be together. It's been a joy to learn things about you, about your word, the truth that it contains, the way it calls us to live. Would you help us as a church family to act on some, some piece of, of what you have brought to our hearts tonight, whether it be a verse we've considered or some other issue, that we would walk in a manner that is pleasing and honoring to you. We thank you so much for reconciling us to yourself and reconciling us to one another as your children. In Christ's name, amen. See you next week.